Thank you. Please. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here. I've already introduced myself and, you know, the, uh, I mean, the colleagues, you know, who came, uh, who came in actually know me. So I don't have to <laughs> really introduce myself. They work in the same field, you know, so they can be critical about what I'm going to say, but I'm sure they won't be. <laughs> Um, so yes, uh, um, I do research and I also do public engagement uh, through bilingualism matters. And uh, so my provocative title is this, right? Um, I'm going to uh, say that a bilingual is not the sum of two monolinguals. And you may you may wonder, doesn't everybody know that? I can tell you that uh, they don't, right? I mean, you know, there is a, an underlying assumption in many places that if you don't speak like a monolingual in language A and a monolingual in language B, you know, you, I mean, what's the point of being, of being bilingual? And I'm going to also say that um, where are the real monolinguals? They're becoming harder and harder to find. And again, you know, you may wonder, well, are you sure about that, you know? <laughs> uh, especially in this country. I mean, lots of people don't know languages, right? Well, we'll come back to this. So, um, how, how, do, how do we define bilingual? For us, a bilingual or a multilingual is someone who knows more than one. So, bilingual technically means two, right? Um, but we use the term bilingual in a broad sense to talk about, you know, trilinguals, quadrilinguals, pentalinguals, if you like that word, you know, so uh, more than one. And so we're going to talk about what it means to have more than one language in your mind. And, uh, and we're going to see that, you know, a bilingual or a multilingual, more than one, doesn't mean no knowledge of the language of all these languages to the same level all the time. Uh, there may be big differences, there may be small differences, but the levels are never the same because it depends on where we are, what we're talking about, who we're talking to, right? And so, um, you know, depending on that, one of the languages may be uh, more, much more advanced than the other or, you know, just a tiny bit more advanced than the other. Uh, so, the main point is that a bilingual is not the sum of two monolinguals. But unfortunately, this is the assumption that uh, sometimes implicitly, right, people are not aware that they're making this assumption, but it is an assumption that underlies uh, a lot of realities around us. Um, and in fact, you know, starting from research, we do research on bilingualism, multilingualism, um, and the classic way of doing research in my field for a long time has been this. You have a group of uh, uh, monolingual native speakers of a language, and then you have a group of second language speakers of the same language. So you compare bilinguals, right? So people who speak the language as a second language, but they have another language, with monolingual native speakers of that language. And this is a classic comparison that uh, has been uh, used for a long time. And the difference between these two groups uh, is taken to be, uh, you know, to, uh, as evidence to, uh, to support particular claims in research. Um, and this, is, this means that in research for a long time, we've used a native monolingual norm as the point of reference. And this is partly because uh, much linguistic research has been done in so-called monolingual countries, the so-called Anglosphere for a long time, where English is the official language. Um, and, uh, and that means, you know, the predominantly monolingual Western countries as well, but particularly the Anglosphere. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, the native monolingual norm is, you know, a reality in these countries. It's not, as we know, in many, in most other countries. Um, and when we talk about second language learning, right, learning a second language, 
Again, we talk about, you know, speaking, reaching a level where you speak like a native speaker, right? So that's the ideal level that you want to reach when you start learning another language. Um, and, uh, you know, almost never, you almost never reach, you know, that level. You're speaking like a native speaker or sounding like a native speaker. Hi. Um, I'm as guilty as anybody else in my research for a long time. I used, we study, you know, people who are, seem to be very advanced in second language learning and reach very high levels. And we, uh, for a long time, we called them near native speakers. And, you know, the term near native, if you think about it, <laughs> implies a comparison with a native speaker. So it means that you're very good and you are almost there, but not quite. Right? You're almost like a native speaker, but not quite. And that's why, you know, I've abandoned this term, but I used it in the past, so um, I'm, as I said, as guilty as anybody else. Um, when we look at research on bilingualism, you know, the, the psychological, cognitive effects on the brain, now we're going to mention some of these, um, you know, again, you know, the advantages or, you know, disadvantages of bilingualism are always... Uh, uh, you know, defined with respect to a native monolingual, you know, a monolingual point of reference. So you compare bilinguals with monolinguals and, hey, bilinguals have advantages compared to monolinguals or bilinguals have some disadvantages compared to monolinguals. So, uh, you know, I'm, uh, yeah, this is something that... Um, so uh, that means that implicitly at least, you know, bilinguals are seen as the sum of two monolingual natives. And I'm going to say the rest of this talk that we need to abandon this perspective, both in research, but also in society. So um, when we look at, you know, uh, research, I mentioned research on effects of bilingualism on the mind, the brain. Um, and uh, we need to separate the many myths about bilingualism. There are many misconceptions, many myths, uh, particularly in countries, you know, in countries close to the monolingual ideal, right? Because in most countries in the world, multilingualism is absolutely normal, is the norm, right? What would be really strange is to find people who know only one language. <laughs> but if you look at our types of society, you know, being multilingual, that's the strange thing, right? So we need to separate the many myths from the facts that are coming out of research. And when I say facts, I don't mean absolute truths, because research goes on all the time. Research is never, you know, uh, completely definitive. You know, we always need to do more research to understand uh, how things work better. And so uh, we are not trying to, you know, present what is coming out of research as the absolute truth that is unmodifiable. Um, but we need to separate also science from science fiction increasingly because there are many misinterpretations of research and I'm going to mention some. So we are at a lucky time when on the one hand we have many misconceptions still there, you know, and so on. On the other hand, we have some new misconceptions that are coming out from, you know, people who might want to understand what was going on in research, but Ultimately, they misunderstand, either involuntarily or even deliberately so. Um, so, myths and facts, very, very brief overview. Um, <clears throat> for very young children, the idea that a bilingual child is confused, right? Again, you know, bilingualism in many societies is absolutely normal, right? So people don't worry about this. But we do, in our types of societies, many parents, you know, think, well, you know, two languages at the same time, uh, you know, that's a burden for a child. Wouldn't it be better to wait until, you know, the child learns the first language and then, you know, introduce, you introduce another one or more languages. But together, the child gets confused, right? They don't learn any language properly. And then, you know, if a child comes from a different language background, migrant children, you know, all the time, I mean, we have this reality, they're 
anticipated to have problems at school because obviously they come from a different uh, language background, they speak another language at home, they have to learn the language of the new environment, which is typically the language of schooling as well. So if they have to go to school, uh, they come to this country, they have to learn English, obviously so, right? And so, uh, you know, people think, well, you know, these, these children are going to have a problem. And we know because we work, you know, with uh, school teachers and personnel that sometimes, you know, uh, quite often, in fact, uh, migrant children are initially isolated. They are put in special groups because they are, you know, they, they're thought, well, you know, these children are going to have a problem otherwise. We'll see later that, in fact, we should actually put them in the classroom straight away because the child, yes, you know, will learn English or whatever the language is if they hear enough of it, but there's no need to isolate them uh, at the beginning. And then, you know, the idea that there are useless and useful languages. So guess what, what makes a language useful? What makes a language useful? How many people speak it? Uh, not only, because there are, you know, there are some languages that are spoken by many, many people, and yet they're not regarded as useful, right? So basically what makes a language useful is the degree of economic, political power that goes together with it, right? Um, and, and that's why some languages become useful, useful, right? But other languages, um, including minority languages, so we were talking about Sardinian, right, before, that's a minority language because it's only spoken in that island. Um, here we have Gaelic in Scotland that is only spoken mostly in the northwest, in the, in the western, uh, western Isles. Um, and the Scots as well. So languages that are only spoken in particular places. Um, those languages are not regarded as very useful. And in fact, fewer and fewer people speak them to their children. As we'll see later, the only thing that can keep a language alive is parents continuing to speak the language to their children from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. If that process stops, you can have the most wonderful government and the most wonderful policies, but if that process stops, the language dies. And there are more and more minority languages dying all the time because they are not regarded as useful. Uh, I'm a good example in point. I mean, my mother never spoke Sardinian to me because she didn't think it was useful. And she thought that I had to learn Italian and English because English is useful. And having Sardinian somewhere in my brain would have been, would have caused confusion. You know, what's the point of having this language? Nobody speaks it, right? So, um, uh, migrant languages also, you know, they may be spoken by many, many people in the countries where they come from, but they're not regarded as particularly useful. Um, so what does research show, very, very briefly? It shows that, for example, um, uh, bilingual children, children who come from a different language background or who learn two languages together, they find it easier to learn another language. So they, they acquire a special sensitivity to how any language works. And so learning a third or a fourth language, when you start from more than one, is easier than when you start from just one. Um, and uh, potentially, you know, they understand, if they hear enough of the majority language, the new language that they have to learn, uh, they have a better insight about the structure of that language as well. Um, uh, and, uh, and they have, you know, there is plenty of research on the uh, uh, in, inroads into literacy, so particularly learning to read. Um, it has been shown that bilingual children uh, have uh, uh, an easier access to the main principles of how to learn to read. So once they discover those principles in one language, they don't have to rediscover them in other languages. So, you know, they, they get into reading in one language, and uh, particularly if they learn another uh, to read another language with the same writing system, um, uh, so, you know, alphabetic systems, which are, you know, the alphabet is the writing system for many of our languages, right? But not for Chinese, of course. Um, so, uh, but, you know, there are transfer 
uh, if you learn to read, you know, if you are, are introduced to reading in one language, you don't have to rediscover these basic principles to learn to read in another language. And there are many studies on the effects, potential effects, and I'm, I'm coming back to this term potential, and we'll see effects of bilingualism outside language. So not just for language, but outside language. So for example, a bilingual child has been shown to have a, 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 a better awareness, uh, so they, they, they gain an awareness of the fact that it is possible to have a different perspective on, uh, from, from your own. So a different point of view in many different ways, right? Not just visually. I mean, if you are there, you can't see what I'm seeing here because we don't share the same visual perspective. But that extends to, you know, uh, uh, perspectives on in, in, in a more general sense. It is possible to have a different point of view. I mean, this is a, a developmental stage for all children, but research shows that bilingual children can get there earlier. And you may wonder why. Why should they get there earlier? Because a bilingual child discovers very quickly that not everybody is bilingual. Not everybody is bilingual in the same languages. And so they have to choose the right language depending on who they are talking to. And so that means stepping out of your linguistic shoes, so to speak, and appreciate the fact that uh, 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 people may have a different language perspective. And that is generalized outside language. There are plenty of studies on the control of attention. So, uh, you know, uh, we have to pay attention to things no matter what we do, otherwise we don't do it well. We have to resist being distracted by other factors that are around us. Could be a noise, could be a worry, could be, you know, something that, you know, interferes with what we're doing. So it has been shown that by some studies that bilingualism actually potentially improves uh, what we call selective attention. So paying attention to what matters for what we're doing and disregarding what doesn't matter for what we're doing. Um, and also switching from one task that requires attention to this to another task that requires attention to something else. So multitasking, you know, sometimes requires, you know, uh, 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 refocusing attention to a different matter. And again, you may wonder what is the link with bilingualism? Why should it be? Why do we see these these effects? Well, you know, one of the uh, uh, reasons that um, uh, has been uh, uh, proposed is that all languages, if you're bilingual, and come back to this, uh, you know, we can see how many of us are bilingual. I think you know most of us or all of us, in fact. Um, all languages are always active in your brain. So you can't switch off a language in the morning or put it in the drawer because we don't need it today. So I'm speaking English to you, but my Italian and the other languages I know are very much active in my brain, and my brain is trying to keep them at bay, to push them out. So this constant mental gymnastics is supposed to have you know, an effect outside language again and lead to a better control of attention, focusing on this and ignoring other irrelevant uh, things. Um, and there are also studies on effects of bilingualism on other sides of the curriculum. This is important, particularly in countries like the UK or the so-called Anglosphere, because languages are not valued. So, you know, people think, well, you know, everybody speaks English. What's the point for us, you know, for our child to learn another language? I mean, we speak English already, uh, right? Um, but in fact, you know, it has been shown that there are potential effects on other areas of the curriculum. STEM subjects, for example, you know, there are components of STEM subjects that might be positively influenced by having more than one language. So mathematical reasoning, uh, logical reasoning, problem solving, and so on. Again, you know, uh, these, these effects are not completely automatic. I'll come back to this. Um, but the fact is that we know, unfortunately, many schools in Scotland, for example, when it comes for a child to choose whether they want to do a language or not, languages are clash in the curriculum with STEM subjects. 
for example. And then, you know, obviously children are advised, well, STEM subjects are more important, right? I mean, languages, yeah, I mean, if you know a language, it's fine. If you don't know a language, that's fine too. Uh, and so, you know, creating those clashes in the curriculum uh, doesn't help anybody. So we try to, you know, talk to schools and persuade them that, you know, children should be encouraged to actually do languages together with STEM, you know, because it's not a waste of time. <clears throat> so why these effects? It's the fact of having more than one language. Remember, we, that's where we started. You know, bilingualism is a general term. It means having more than one language in, in the mind. So any language is good from this point of view. Whether it's a language, an official language, whether it's prestigious language, which, as we said before, means uh, be having economic and, uh, and political prestige. Um, uh, whether it's a, a variety or a dialect, you know, the term dialect, it's, it's not a very, a very positive term in general, right? It, it kind of denotes, you know, a less useful language. But in fact, you know, and sign languages are also languages in all, in all respects, but they use a different modality. So all languages, dialects, varieties, you know, signed, not signed, are good from this point of view. So all languages should be encouraged, not only because from a cultural point of view, and I, I would like to, you know, make it clear that, you know, there are benefits of bilingualism that are not, you know, uh, don't emerge from cognitive research or linguistic research. We know that beyond, behind every language, there is a culture. So a bilingual child, a multilingual child, is often a multicultural child, and that can only be an advantage, right? Sensitivity to linguistic and cultural diversity. But there are also these potential, uh, potential benefits. The effects are not automatic, and here comes the interesting stuff, because and we, we come for, to the main point of this talk, right? Remember, you know, we used to compare a group of bilinguals with a group of monolinguals. But in fact, um, now we know that uh, these effects are not automatic because not all bilinguals or multilinguals are the same. It depends on the kind of experience of bil bilingualism and multilingualism people have. And you can have very different kinds of experiences. So in research, we are now trying to understand the factors that create these differences and how these factors actually interact with one another. So there's still quite a lot of work to do in research, but we are now conceptualizing bilingualism, and in fact, monolingualism as well, I'll come back to this, as a continuum ranging from less bilingual to more bilingual. And the continuum, where you are on the continuum, depends on a variety of factors that we are still trying to understand. For example, language distance, um, I'll mention this in a, in a minute. Uh, how the languages are used. Do you live in a community where everybody understands both languages? Or do you live in a community where there's only one language, for the official language, and the other language is only spoken at home, for example? And that means that, you know, whether you switch from one language to the other changes depending on, depending on these factors. Uh, attitudes, as we'll see, what people think about these languages. And children absorb adults' attitudes very, very quickly. They, are, they don't have negative attitudes at the beginning, but very soon, as they grow up, they absorb negative attitudes, individual differences, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so these are factors in, you know, uh, heritage bilingualism, for example, you know, children learning, you know, a, a, two languages, one is the language of the parent, one of the parent, parents or, or, uh, or both parents, and the other one is the language of the environment. Um, so, uh, so I'll give you an example. Uh, my, I have two bilingual sons who grew up with Italian and English. My husband is American, he speaks very good Italian, but they were born here, and so English uh, obviously was the language of the environment. We tried to reinforce Italian as much as we could in a variety of ways. Uh, but it's quite clear that the Italian that my children heard from me was not the same as the Italian that I heard from my parents while I, I was growing up in Italy. 
And we'll see that because attrition, so, you know, my Italian has changed, and not in a way of that, you know, it doesn't mean that I lost it and now I'm losing it, but it has changed because of the constant contact with English and the other language, but English is the main, the main contact. So, so uh, you know, if parents undergo this process of changes, obviously, you know, the language uh, learned by their children, so heritage bilinguals, um, will inevitably be different or slightly different from the language they learned. So from one generation to the next. Language distance, so we'll give you an example in a minute. Uh, exposure to variation. So we always tell you know, parents, um, your child needs to hear the language not only from mommy or daddy, you know, who speaks this language, but also from other speakers who naturally speak in different ways. Think of a monolingual child, right? To use this term. Uh, think of a child who, you know, learns English here. I mean, obviously, you know, they, they, they hear it not only from the parents, but also from many other people, you know, who naturally speak in different ways. And this is very important, you know, this natural variation. It's very important for language learning and language acquisition. Uh, in a minority language, or in heritage language, uh, very often this is... I, very often this is not possible, you know, and the language is only heard from the parent, you know, who speaks this language. So trying to create, you know, if there isn't a big community, trying to create a mini community where people naturally speak in different ways, this is something that is very, is very important. Literacy, acquiring literacy in the minority language opens up a world uh, you know, for a child, a source of input, a source of enjoyment, a source of commitment, a source of entertainment uh, that helps, you know, motivates a child. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, you know, how often uh, uh, people uh, could switch uh, uh, between one language and another in the community and attitudes. So um, let's look at some data just, uh, just to give you some examples. So minority languages, we mentioned minority languages only spoken in certain places. So when we talk about the advantages, you know, the potential benefits that I, I've mentioned, we find interesting differences here. So there is research on Sardinian Italian that we also contributed to, and some of these effects are found. Uh, Gallic English, yes, these effects are found. Not all of them, but some are found. Uh, Frisian Dutch, in some respects, yes, in some respects, no. Uh, Welsh English, no, no effects have been found. Uh, Cypriot Greek, Greek, yes, the effects have been found. Uh, Catalan Spanish, yes, the effects have been found. Basque, Sp Basque Spanish, no, the effects haven't been found. So, you know, it's really, you know, why do we see, and this is not, you know, a, an exhaustive list of all studies, right? But just, just to show you that, you know, sometimes a study goes in one direction and sometimes it goes in the other direction. So, why is that? I mean, all of these are minority languages, but, you know, they, they are characterized by different bilingual experiences um, that we need to understand. So, patterns of bilingual use, for example. So, you have dual language context where everybody understands, you know, most people understand both languages. Uh, so, for example, Welsh English, uh, the effects are not found. Basque Spanish, the effects are not found. But Catalan Spanish, yes, they are found. Um, single language context where the languages are really divided. So, one language is spoken only at home, the other language is spoken outside the home. Sardinian is one of these languages. Sardinian Italian, the effects are found. Uh, Cypro Greek Greek, yes, the effects are found. Gallic English, the effects are found. Frisian Dutch, partly found. So, again, you know, the context seems to determine, you know, that where if the languages are more separated, the effects are easier to find. And, uh, and, uh, and so, you know, what we call cognitive control, which underlies these effects, adapts to context, is influenced by context of language use. So in dual language context, you know, where both languages are spoken by, uh, by most people, um, people don't need to exclude one of the languages very much, right? Because they can rely on the fact that everybody 
can understand both languages. So there's less of an effort to keep one of the languages at bay, and there is more switching, because people can switch from one language to the other. Uh, but single language context, again, Sardinian, you know, language close to my heart, that's not possible, because Sardinian tends to be spoken only at home. Outside the home, you only speak Italian. So there's no switching. And no, you know, so when you are at home, you really try to keep Italian out of the picture. When you are outside the home, you try to keep Sardinian out of the picture and you apply more of an effort. Um, so, so all this to say, social practices, context, attitudes matter, and typological distance also matters. Um, language distance, uh, more similar languages, so Catalan Spanish, more similar, the effects are found. Sardinian Italian, both Romance languages, effects are found. The Cypriot Greek and Greek, yes. Frisian Dutch, effects partly found. But these similar languages, Welsh English, effects not found. Basque Spanish, effects not found. Gallic English, unlike the other two, the effects are found. So we don't see a clear, consistent picture, but we actually uh, try to take these factors into account. Cognitive control also adapts to typological distance, which can be great or less, you know, depending on what we're talking about, typologically similar languages, and that applies, by the way, to dialects or varieties, right? I mean, you potentially have to apply more effort to keep them at bay because they're more similar. Um, and, uh, and so more, you know, control to keep them apart um, and uh, 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 um, less need for inhibition in social interaction, more switching, but typologically different language, you know, they're so dis distant, you know, from one another. So you don't need to apply a lot of effort to keep one at bay because they are already distant, right? And, uh, and so on. So all of these factors, do we understand them completely? No, we need a lot more research uh, to understand these effects. Attitudes. We did a, an interesting study on, uh, this, was, this was a study with sociologists, so, uh, you know, a real collaboration between uh, uh, linguistics, uh, psychology, and sociology. Um, and uh, uh, we, we really, um, we were allowed to speak to bilingual children without the parents, without the teachers. We had ethical approval. We had long conversations with these uh, uh, children. Um, and, uh, and so we collected both qualitative data about, you know, what children thought about their being bilingual in these languages and quantitative data. And we actually studied two types of bilingualism. Bilingualism with Gaelic, so minority language here in Scotland, and bilingualism with migrant languages, so a variety of migrant languages. Um, and what we found was, not surprisingly perhaps, that children with positive attitudes about their languages and their being bilingual in supporting families, in supportive environments and schools, actually showed the effects, the positive effects of bilingualism more than the children with less positive attitudes. Again, you know, not terribly surprising, surprising but we need this data. And, uh, and by uh, uh, speaking to these children, we actually discovered, you know, really, other emotional things, you know, because some of these children told us, you know, I, they didn't like to speak the, their minority language, but they said, please don't tell my mom and dad, because they think I do. So, you know, even this, you know, parents, you know, kind of want, you know, their child, you know, to, uh, to like their heritage language, but, you know, in fact, this uh, doesn't, doesn't happen. And that's why with bilingualism matters, we talk more and more to children as well, not to year olds, I mean, that, that would be a bit more difficult, but, you know, children from the age of eight onwards, um, because, you know, we, we want them to be aware of their being bilingual and proud of their being bilingual. We go into classrooms, you know, we say, oh, how many of you speak another language? They raise their hands. Okay, I'm going to tell you how lucky you are. And once you get them involved, they come up with the most interesting questions. And uh, so I think we need, uh, we really need to do 
more. And for minority languages, bilingualism with minority languages, there is a big obstacle here. Okay, that doesn't come from children, it comes from grown-ups. Um, the so-called purism. So, uh, you know, people who are really interested, in, you know, in these minority languages, they often think that the language is going down the drain. The language is not spoken the way, you know, our grandparents spoke it, which is not totally normal, by the way. Again, you know, a lively language doesn't stay the same. A language that doesn't change anymore, it's a dead language. So Latin doesn't change anymore because it's dead. If a language is alive, it will change from one generation to the next. But there are pe these people who think, well, you know, yeah, no, I mean, we should do something because the language is getting contaminated, you know, it's not really spoken in the way uh, by bilingualism, you know, it's contaminated, we should do something about it. But in fact, you know, as I said, language change is absolutely normal in bilingualism. Uh, so languages in contact affect each other in specific very interesting ways, uh, both in the same brain, so in the same individual, but also in societies. We study this phenomenon, it goes under the bad term of attrition, but in fact, you know, it doesn't imply loss. It really implies changes, both at the individual level and at the social level. So change is not loss or contamination, it's a sign of uh, being alive, in fact, right? Uh, it's not deterioration of linguistic standards, but uh, but, you know, if, if uh, we put too much emphasis on this deterioration, uh, we actually, uh, you know, demotivate young people. And we see this, you know, in our, in our contact, you know, with society. We get young people who say, hey, you know, I like to speak this language, but I don't want to be corrected all the time because I don't speak like, like my dad or my granddad. I mean, you know, I want, to, I want to be free to insert a word from English, for example, if I think, you know, that's, uh, that's appropriate. So, um, so uh, you know, I've already mentioned this, you know, changes in first-generation speakers. I've, I've given you my example, you know, my Italian has changed after 30 years in an English-speaking country. And uh, uh, because I don't live in an Italian community anymore. So I'm less exposed to no normal variation. I sometimes speak with other Italians who are also migrant, you know, and so, you know, we typically reinforce each other, you know, in the, the changes in our, uh, in our language. So this is called horizontal transmission uh, of changes, you know, accommodating to each other's choices. The bigger the community, the more, you know, these changes are likely to spread. And, uh, and, uh, and, get, and get reinforced. Um, and, uh, you know, for first generation speakers like myself, if I went back to Italy and I lived there, probably many of these changes will regress and disappear. Okay? So, re re immersion in the original community uh, re partially reverses these changes uh, to, uh, to the native language. Uh, but my children, as I said, you know, they learned an Italian that was partly different from the Italian that I learned from my parents. And so they are likely to keep these changes. And if they decide to speak Italian to their children, they will transmit these changes. And this is one of the ways natural languages change over time. You know, again, if a language is alive, it will change. If a language is dead, it doesn't change anymore. Um, uh, and uh, we are actually working on a very interesting project uh, uh, theme at the moment. You know, we think that these changes in the native language are actually functional to uh, a good level of bilingualism. So they're functional to the learning, the level reached in the second language. So you reach a higher level if you are able to reconfigure, you know, your native language in particular ways so that you create a, an harmonic space in your brain to support uh, active bilingualism. So we think that there is a, a connection between changes in the native language. So far from being negative, they may be actually functional to learning, uh, learning and becoming bilingual. Um, and this is exactly two sides of the same coin. That's exactly what I just said. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is an example I don't have time to show you, you know, this guy, young guy, you know, who was on the internet, he's a Welsh speaker, but he said, you know, again, you know, 
if you, you know, he, he, he speaks Welsh and he likes Welsh, but, but he's also, you know, he, he can't stand being corrected or being told that the Welsh he speaks is not very good. Um, and as I said, you know, bilingualism is necessary. I mean, the vast, vast, vast majority of languages are in a situation of bilingualism or multilingualism with one or more majority languages. That is a, a very interesting diagram. So how many languages are spoken in the world? Nobody knows exactly. You know, let's say around 7,000, between 6,000, 7,000. Of these languages, 25 languages are spoken by half of the world's population. 25. 25. So that means that, you know, again, the vast majority of languages are minority languages and they are uh, survive in a situation of bilingualism, multilingualism with other languages. So we need to understand, you know, bilingualism and multilingualism better to help the languages to survive. Um, ultimately, we can't do much, right? I mean, you know, in 200 years, many of those languages will have died. Right, and uh, but we can slow down the process at least through uh, you know information about bilingualism and multilingualism. To go back to the original title, so well, monolingual, monolinguals. You know why are we saying that monolinguals uh, are becoming you know are, are on the verge of extinction? Um, well, uh, there are very interesting studies about what happens in multilingual communities. So, um, both in multilingual classrooms, but also, you know, more generally in multilingual countries and multilingual communities. So, uh, there was uh, this study uh, done uh, in the States where they compared um, adults, Americans. They all said, oh, I don't speak any other language. I only speak English, absolutely. It's not difficult to find people like that in the States. Um, and some of them were in California, and some of them were in Pennsylvania. Now, not Philadelphia, but central Pennsylvania, where, uh, uh, yeah, and it's mostly English. But California is a very multilingual environment, right? So the Americans in California are passively exposed to multilingualism in society. They hear other languages. They don't understand them, but they hear them all the time, much more than the Americans in Pennsylvania. Right? So this study actually uh, compared these two groups and, uh, of monolinguals and, uh, uh, with both uh, uh, behavioral tests. So everybody had to learn a new language. And the new language was Finnish, which is a rather difficult language uh, you know, for most people. Um, nobody knew any Finnish. Everybody had to. And, uh, and then brain reactions as well as tests, behavioral tests were taken, and basically after six months, there wasn't a, a, a strong behavioral difference between monolinguals in California and monolinguals in Pennsylvania, but their brain told a different story. The brain of the Californians was much more similar to the brain of the bilinguals, who were also tested you know, in all groups, uh, than the brain of the, of the Pennsylvanians. Now, uh, what does that mean? Uh, Obviously, they don't know. It might mean that you know even passive exposure to multilingualism can prepare the brain for learning other languages, even in the absence of any conscious, you know, awareness or conscious knowledge about these languages. And multilingual classrooms. This is actually a study that we did, where we compared. This was a long project where years ago we compared. Uh, multi, uh, uh, classrooms in Scotland, they were more or less multilingual. And so there were some classrooms where uh, more than 50% of uh, students were from other countries, from other language backgrounds, and classrooms where only 5% of students were from other classrooms. So the vast majority were Scottish monolingual, monolingual children, right? Um, and uh, again, we followed them over time. Everybody had to learn a new language, and the new language was Spanish. We didn't inflict a very difficult language. No, there were no Spanish-speaking uh, children in any of these classrooms. So Spanish was new for everybody. And, uh, and we tested them on a regular basis, um, and with both linguistic and uh, cognitive tests. 
And what we found was very interesting. First of all, and not very surprisingly perhaps, uh, a greater number of multilingual children passed the Spanish and cognitive test, uh, even if many of them were still learning English, because they, depending on when they had arrived to this country, they were still learning English, but you know, they cope with Spanish quite well. But there's also a trend that we're trying to replicate. A trend means it's a result that, you know, it's not terribly strong, but it points in an interesting direction. And so it needs more data, it needs to be replicated. But monolingual children, Scottish children, in more multilingual classrooms, they actually performed better, both in the Spanish test and in the cognitive test. Now, that can only be the result of Exposure to other languages in an encouraging environment, in a positive environment where children's curiosity, natural curiosity for each other was stimulated. Uh, so children, you know, children were not segregated outside the classroom because otherwise they're going to have a problem. You know, they were all in the same classroom. Children were encouraged to know more about languages and that had a positive effect on monolingual children. So again, you know, it's a kind of parallel effect. So, I've spoken uh, enough. Um, so, given this situation, we think that, um, first of all, yeah, uh, uh, there are fewer and fewer real monolinguals. I mean, given that we live in more and more multilingual societies, so the real monolingual Perhaps, you know, uh, very soon we'll have to go to the top of the mountain, you know, to find somebody in complete isolation, you know, and, and so on. But, um, but otherwise, you know, we live in multilingual societies. We need to understand multilingualism better to maintain minority languages, to encourage linguistic diversity, which means cultural diversity and so on. So we think that, you know, more information leads to better decisions. Um, and that's why we're trying to build bridges across different subfields of research uh, on bilingualism and society. So research and society. And I, I, I said something in the very beginning uh, about, uh, about this. Um, uh, because people make decisions all the time. And we saw the prejudices, we saw the lack of information, the misconceptions and so on. But people have to make decisions about their children and about their students, and about their patients, and about their businesses, and about their, you know, I mean, the whole lot, you know, of uh, um, uh, sectors of society. So that's why I started Bilingualism Matters, um, and that's what we do. We try to uh, communicate research in a way that people in very different sectors of society can understand and can use to make decisions about uh, uh, that, that concerned their, uh, their own life. Um, we are now a, an independent, not-for-profit organization. Uh, we are a spin-out of the University of Edinburgh. We have a branch at the University of Edinburgh, but we also have 34 branches uh, all over the world. And uh, we opened uh, we opened the last one in California uh, two weeks ago online. Unfortunately, I couldn't go <laughs> uh, to open it on. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, some of my colleagues here are familiar with this because they have a branch in their country. Um, so we can join forces in more than one way. We can join forces in research, but we can also join forces in public engagement by comparing, you know, what is done uh, in, in different contexts, different languages, different political systems, uh, we can really uh, compare different kinds of experiences and uh, come up with the best ways of, uh, uh, of communicating research. Um, and this is where I stop and I'm uh, uh, waiting for your questions. <laughs> Yes. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, fascinating, <coughs> and it's uh, I've, I've always tried to take what what you've shared and try and operationalise it. What I have found is uh, the the politeness and generosity of other people. Say, groups of people are from Spain, 
will often switch to English to in, help me not be outside of the, the language. So of, often people are, are avoiding excluding people. <laughs> um, and how, how do we find a, a, mon a monoglot like myself? How do I find these community situations where I can listen and learn? Is it enough for me to listen to, uh, for example, I've taken to listening to um, videos that review films in other languages? Well, it's one what's way. Your recommendation? I mean, it, 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 it's one way. I mean, you know, people ask me, is Duolingo you know, enough? I mean, it's a very good introduction to another language, but you know, you reach a level where you have to actually see people, you know, real people, you know, and interact with them and adjust, you know, your language behavior to whoever you're talking to. And that's the real experience, right? Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, there isn't a, a single way, you know, to learn a language that is good for everybody, right? Uh, but we certainly have to, you know, I mentioned some of the, some of the, uh, the factors that, you know, particularly for children, you know, they, they need to hear the language from different speakers. That's true of adults as well. They need to, you know, be exposed to normal variation. That's, uh, that's uh, you know, uh, uh, true for adults as well. I mean, just, again, to give you a, a personal experience, um, I, when I, I studied German, uh, my teacher was from Austria, and he had a strong Austrian accent. And then I decided to go and practice my German to Germany, and I went to Bremen. <laughs> and I couldn't understand anything. I really felt, you know, very discouraged because I, uh, you know, I had been, my exposure had been quite limited, you know, classroom to this guy who spoke with a strong Austrian accent. But anyway, it's just, uh, just to say, you know, yeah, there isn't a, a single way, but interacting with people motivate in a motivated way, you know, um, it's certainly something. Ooh, any questions? Yeah. Um, how did you feel about that branch? As part about what? Um, okay, this is an interesting question that uh, I don't think uh, the person I was talking to I was talking to somebody last night at a party, and uh, but he's not here, and uh, he asked me this question: um, Wouldn't it be better if there was just one language for everybody? <laughs> and now I, I, I'm throwing this point to you because it's related to what you're, you know, Esperanto say, right? It's, it's not a natural language, right? I mean, would that help the world if everybody learned Esperanto? We spent many years working on it. Okay. About six, years working on it. And a huge amount of money. And then the whole idea was just scrapped. Nobody wanted to learn it. Why do you think nobody wanted to learn it? Uh. <laughs> I might be exaggerating, but it will be similar to a world government, which... Absolutely, absolutely. It would be an imposition. I mean, you know, uh, what I, I was trying to, when I talked to this, uh, uh, this guy last night, you know, I was trying to say, we actually try to encourage Understanding linguistic diversity as a value, linguistic and cultural diversity as a value. I mean, now having one language for all, I mean, quite apart from the fact, how do you persuade people, to, you know, without imposing it, you know, force or, you know, political, you know, circumstances and so on. But um, would that, oh, but, you know, you would say, it would facilitate communication, right? Because everybody would speak one language. And then, you know, they can speak the other languages as well. But this would be the common language that everybody speaks, and that would facilitate uh, harmonic communication. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that is probably not true, right? Well, what do you think? Um, yes. So I was interested, well, of course I was interested in all of it, but I was particularly interested in the part where, where you mentioned the, the speaking to languages, especially to moderately but not highly dissimilar languages, mm -hmm. is beneficial in terms of, by the sound of it, 
sounds like something like building up a cognitive reserve or skill set for uh, supporting inhibition, mm. yeah, for, for suppressing uh, uh, you know, an instinctive thought and allowing more context suitable other instinctive thought, i.e. the response in, in, in the language of the given environment to, to kind of come through. Now, I don't know if it was the last um, Ragged University, but it was definitely the last one that I attended. It was about ADHD mm -hmm. uh, with Fred. And mm -hmm. I think, uh, uh, although a lot of that context was about the medicalization, um, whether it's un over or under diagnosed, there is this aspect of, which I think is, is more, is broader than that, which is about the, you know, there's variations in working memory and there's variations in executive function. So I'd be interested in, um, it, it, in to, you know, understanding about that sort of relationship uh, and possibly the kind of causality of it. So does someone with low uh, impulse control have more difficulty on average learning a second language? Does learning a second language support? Clearly, individual differences are, are there, right? I mean, you know, so we can't, uh, I mean, to the extent that we can generalize on the basis of, you know, results of particular studies, I mean, we have also to take into account, as you're suggesting, that there are, there are individual differences, obviously. And, uh, uh, you know, you were talking about, you know, particular situations. I mean, there are studies, for example, on, you know, um, autism, and, uh, you know, dyslexia and particular conditions, right? And uh, this is one of the, you know, people generally are afraid that if a child has this condition, one of these conditions, then bilingualism is no, no, because it would uh, exacerbate, you know, the condition. It would make life even... In fact, you know, there's no actual evidence that bilingualism is incompatible with these conditions. There's no evidence that bilingualism can actually cure the conditions, you know. So remember science fiction and, you know, we have to, we have to be aware of that, you know, because it's not, you know, a magic experience that treats, you know, and... Uh, but definitely... Uh, just no, related to that, yeah. I guess there's the question of <laughs> dyslexia, whether it, it can really exist in a language like, or a written language like Chinese. Right. Yeah, because because of the different writing system that, you know, it's not based on the spoken language, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that, you know, uh, clearly, you know, we, we need more research on that and so on. But, um, but, but I think, you know, the point is, uh, yeah, there are individual differences that have to be taken into account. We can generalize, you know, up to a point, but, you know, we have to take individual differences into account. Um, and if we can find, you know, if we find some counter evidence, you know, powerful, I mean, we have to be ready to revise what, what we know about bilingualism. At the moment, you know, these are generalizations that seem to hold, right? Um, but again, you know, we have to be careful not to, you know, uh, assume that they apply blanket-wise to everybody. And uh, so, because, as I said, there are many different factors that we don't fully understand yet. So, yeah, we are doing more research. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for the interesting and informative talk. I have actually two questions. One is about your continuum of bilingualism. Or bilingualism. And I just wonder whether in your definition of bilingual and on this continuum, have you considered the distinction between comprehension and production? I'm, I'm thinking of some migrant children that I know yeah. who can understand their parents' language, yeah. but they don't speak, they can't speak it. Yeah. It's definitely one of the factors that has to be taken into account. Yeah. And so, another, an, another question I have is about Braille um, as a language. Mm -hmm. if, if, do you know whether there is any study about how we can affect the cognitive ability of... You said Braille? Braille. Huh? Of blind people, braille. braille. Oh, braille. Yeah. Um, I'm not. Yes, there there is research. You know, I'm. Uh, I can't think of anything. You know, maybe my colleagues can. Any any study on that that you can think of? Yeah. But but yeah, I mean that that could be you know maybe seen as a yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah, it's uh, just a kind. Yes. You know, some blind people might use Braille. Yeah. Some don't. Yes. So, and so that does that make a difference? I can't think of any study on that, but it's definitely a very a very interesting topic. But yeah, what you were saying about you know understanding. So you know, uh, for a long time, you know, I can understand Sardinian, but I don't speak it. Because, you know, my mother never spoke it to me, but she spoke it with other relatives. And so I heard, in, I, I heard enough of it that I developed comprehension. I can understand everything. Does that make me, well, even before I learned English, right? Uh, does it mean that I grow up bilingual? Well, along that continuum, yes. Yes. Because, you know, we're not talking about, again, the bilingual as the sum of two monolinguals, you know, who can do everything in language A as well as in language B. There are differences and so on. So, so yeah, I, I, I'm now more inclined to think that, you know, I did grow up with another language in the background, although I never became fully fluent in that language. In that context, would it mean the whole idea of mother tongue is not useful in your research or in your conceptualization, mother tongue, father yeah. tongue, or, or native language. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you know, a native language, you know, by definition is the language that you hear from birth, language or languages that, that you, you know, you, you Even hear. if you can't speak it. Again, you know, along that continuum, yes, I mean, Sardinian, I heard it from since I was born. It was in the environment since I was born, um, but it wasn't spoken to me. So it was in the environment, and I heard it. So yeah. So yeah, it's a mother tongue if you want to use this this term or a native language. Yes. Well, I have three questions. The first one is uh, you said about passive passive learning language will be useful. I I disagree with that. Yeah, because because I I, I think I have spent a lot of time uh, learning English. Yeah, just the passively listen to the video tapes a lot of time. Then uh, then with uh, I think a lot of Chinese people learn the English this hard way. And then then they find that it is not it's, it's useless. And the, the effective way to learn a new language is the meaningful input is to learn to listen to the uh, language in according to the level. This the material not too hard. It's too if it's, it is too hard. Even we listen to the cat talk a lot a long time, we never know what's the cat's language. So this is my first disagreement. <laughs> yeah. And, and the second one is uh, you, you you give an example that that the students are of bilingual and uh, uh, they have higher scores with then those students have only one la one language. What if uh, this is the difference? Uh, between the students, uh, the, the students learn the two languages just because are, these students are more clever, more curiosity, so they are much better than this one. I think it is very common to see that one student is very good at one subject, but uh, and, and he it must be, well, every subject he learns very well, not because that uh, it is the student that is the difference, not the, the, lang the language the difference. And the third one, uh, Ooh. Third, uh, you're, you're, you're trying my, my, my short-term memory. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, the third one is about the, 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 good, the benefits of learning multiple languages. I think uh, it, it's either it lies in the language itself or, in, or lies in the language that, uh, that, uh, um, that, that, that the language that, uh, behind the, the culture behind the language. Because the, as I am Chinese, I, I'm Chinese I, I have to learn English because the most uh, the, the newest research, scientific research development are written in English. So if, if I only learn no Chinese, then I will le left behind the work. So I, I have to learn English. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and, uh, and there is a, there is a uh, phenomenon in China that uh, the, best, uh, the best political, uh, I, I don't know which, uh, the, the political researchers are uh, researchers not is not uh, those people major in politics. It's a major in English because <laughs> because these English majors they can translate the Western uh, politicals into Chinese and they they know this politics much better. 
That's my joke. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting questions. Now, you know, which one shall I answer first? <laughs> I mean, clearly, you know, yeah. Can you remind me what your first one? First one is passive learning English. I don't think it's effective. Yeah, it's my own experience. Well, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that you know these any you know, passive exposure leads to learning, right? But it creates, you know, a very good basis. You know, it seems. I mean, clearly we need more research, but you know, these changes in the brain, for example, might be the precursor to you know successive uh, uh, learning. So, so clearly, exposure, even passive exposure, these people said they didn't understand any other language, but they heard them in their everyday life. So, you know, it might have some effects that we still don't fully understand. Um, so, you know, whether it can actually lead to you know, better language learning abilities, we don't know yet. So, uh, absolutely. Okay, the second one is the, the, the bilingual students act better than the uh, monolingual students. I think there is an individual difference. There are individual differences, but again, you know, I mean, in, in research, you know, we tried, or we tried to keep, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to take uh, individual differences into account. I mean, it's always very different, right? Very difficult to take all the factors into account when you do when you do an analysis. Um, but you know, the and that's why you know the bigger the sample, the better, because the bigger the population you test, you know, the more you know you can uh, generalize across differences, you know, from individual to individual. So, yes, there may be individual differences. So what you're suggesting is that, for example, these classrooms that we tested, maybe, you know, these kids were already, you know, uh, more, uh, I don't know, more uh, uh, interested, lively, you know, intelligent and so on, regardless of whether, you know, the classroom was more or less multilingual. Is that what you're saying? I mean, yeah, we can't rule it out, but it seems to me that, you know, we, this is why we do research, you know, we use uh, statistical measures and so on. Um, you know, if you manage to identify, you know, the factor exposure to other, you know, to more or less multilingual classrooms as, as one of the factors, the factor that you, matters that you're interested in, then you have some basis to say, that, you know, that's probably the factor that affected, you know, these children. Clearly, there are individual differences, and we need to understand them better, as, uh, as I said before. Third question? The third question is uh, the benefit. I think the great, greatest benefit of yeah. learning English is to get oh, yeah. too close to the culture behind the language. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, Not the language itself. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah, you. Sorry, thank you. Sorry. Great talk, thank you uh, for sharing your thank knowledge. You. Um, so my question is, I, I grew up in Sweden, and uh, Swedish language has about 9 million words, and the English language has infinitely more. And often, I think, uh, I believe the Swedish language, you know, there's been a, an inclination to take the English word for something and add it to the language. And I, I suppose my question is, from that, is do you think that process over you know, several years, and I mean, I think in Sweden, it's been maybe you know, 40, 50 years now of kind of adopting English in, in replacement for Swedish words, kind of, you know, coming with original words. Does that undermine being bilingual? You know, if your language is, is you know, I suppose it's a, maybe a slightly blunt phrase, but if it's subservient to English, mm -hmm. does that undermine the value of learning it? I mean, does that kind of reduce its value? I don't know. The value of Swedish, you mean, you know? Yeah, yeah. specifically. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, clearly, you know, there are prestigious languages, right, that, you know, everybody wants to learn. English still occupies the, that place, right, because, I mean, it wasn't that, like this, you know, a century ago, because the political situation was completely different, right? And now, you know, English has become, you know, the, the prestigious language. I mean, clearly, you know, yes, this will have some effect on, on Swedish as well as, you know, other languages and so on. And that is what, you know, historically happened, you know, all the time. You know, if you look at, you know, how Latin, you know, developed and then influenced other languages, you know, I mean, if you go back a long time, I mean, clearly, you know, uh, political issues, you know, 
people conquering, you know, other countries and so on and bringing their land. I mean, all of these, you know, create situations in which, you know, there is a prestigious language that affects the other or others, you know, in particular ways. It doesn't mean that, you know, Swedish will die. I mean, again, you know, if, I mean, it seems to me it's still pretty strong, right? I mean, compared to some of the minority languages that I mentioned that, you know, if a language has only, you know, 500 speakers, that language, you know, can be predicted to be dead pretty soon because, you know, the, those, those people are unlikely to speak it to their children. They are older and older, maybe, you know. So this intergenerational transmission doesn't happen. Yeah, you know, for Swedish, clearly it will happen, you know, for some time to come, you know. So, so yeah, I mean, yeah, there will be effects in, one, in that direction, right, from English to Swedish, as long as, you know, the present... Uh, political situation will be such where English is still the prestigious language that everybody wants to learn. Predictably, you know, that might change in the future, you know. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah. Yes. I have a couple of points to make to add to this lady's uh, yeah. questions, and then I have another question. But I think, in terms of big passive learning, someone parent was a translator, not knowing this language as well as now, but just being exposed to the sound from TV, to media, from everything. It's like music, you develop an ear for the sound of the melody. So when it comes to the time when you actually decide to formally study it, you've realized you already have the music mm -hmm. of it in your head. So when it comes to production, you might not know the words exactly, but for example, an Italian word, which has Italian has a lot of you know musical kind of elements to it, you'll know how to say it with that melody. And so that was my experience of that. And then the second part about studying in schools, if you're a bilingual child, and for example, you know, I don't know, a different language and you're learning English as PAL, for example, and then suddenly you're speaking French or Spanish, you might not have exposure to any of those languages before, but you're able to make connections that you wouldn't be able to make if you spoke one language. So I speak English as my native language, but my mother tongue is Persian. And when I went to secondary school and I started learning French, yep. I started to realize there's so many French loan words that are in Persian that I would not have been able to use if I was just using yeah. basic yeah. English. Mm -hmm. And that way I was able to look at listening and production. And that was a shock to me at the time, and it shocks you as an adult. But even that, now I'm learning Italian, there's so many words that I've got in Persian that I'm not using in English that are coming up in Italian and in that French learning. So it's about having that network of, you know, it's like having so many different maps in your head instead of just one map to get to one. So those are his comments. But my third, my question is, earlier you mentioned how Sardinian hasn't got a standard kind of Written. It doesn't, it doesn't yet. Exist, <laughs> but for somewhere that's just got such a rich history, how do you preserve that language going forward in the future? And if it's only being passed down in different versions to children, but still it's quite, you know, it's known to be, it's a recognized language amongst, yep. how do you ensure you preserve that when it's so? you know, compartmentalized in different areas and things like that. Well, precisely. I mean, you know, this is the message that I'm, when I do political work in Sardinia, you know, this is the message I'll try to, uh, you know, pass on. Uh, it's natural to have different varieties. I mean, and you know, if a language is alive, it has different varieties. So it's a good thing, you know, that, you know, people in the north of the island, you know, speak in a slightly different way, you know, from people in the south of the island. And that's absolutely fine. Uh, when it comes to a written standard, a written standard is necessarily a compromise, right? I mean, think of written English, you know, that, that, that people learn in school. I mean, how many varieties of English are there? I mean, many, many, right? But the written English doesn't reflect necessarily, you know, this variety or that variety or that variety. So this is a, you know, and unfortunately, in a situation like Sardinia, there is no agreement on the written standard, which means that Sardinian can't be studied, can't be used as a means for education in schools. 
So I was in the Gaelic speaking school the other day. I was speaking to parents, right? I mean, there, everybody, everything is taught in Gaelic. All, you know, this is not a bilingual school. It's a Gaelic speaking school, Gaelic medium education school. Yeah, and, uh, you know, there is a, obviously a written standard that people have agreed on, although there are different varieties of Gaelic, you know, the Gaelic spoken, you know, in the, uh, you know, uh, well, whatever, you know, in different places, you know, in Scotland, they're not the same, because natural languages have different varieties. But if you don't reach an agreement on the written language, you know, that compromises the possibility that Sardinian may be used as a medium of instruction and therefore might reinforce the possibility that it will be passed on to generation to generation to generation. Sorry, you had another question. Oh no, your, your point, your first point, you know, you made about music. I can recognize myself, you know, in what you're saying because, uh, you know, uh, I remember when I was a child, you know, an adolescent, learning English songs before I started learning English, right? And so, you know, I didn't understand what I was singing. <laughs> and then, you know, I reached a level where, ah, that's what it means, <laughs> what I was singing. And, but, but, but I think, you know, that created, you know, an inroad into the language, you know, that was, was probably motivating. Yeah? So I wonder about the extra duties that the in have. Uh, outside the language. And so I wonder how much it can be assigned to language itself, because learning any new skill will open your horizon, will help you to focus on this mm -hmm. and that, like dancing or Absolutely. drawing, etc. And so is there is something that indicates it's exactly a language that makes all the speakers? That's a very good point, and thank you for raising it. So, you know, and this is, you know, when I talked about science and science fiction, I think, you know, we have to be careful, you know, not to say that bilingualism is a unique and magic experience that, you know, can give you all these benefits. Um, because, in fact, you know, there are, there's more and more research that compares different kinds of experiences, you know, say musical training, for example. Um, there is a lot of research on aging, right, and, you know, the potential effects on delaying certain normal effects of aging. Uh, so people can compensate, you know, for normal, absolutely normal effects of aging that start, by the way, much earlier than anybody thinks. You know, we think, I used to think that, you know, oh, you have to be in your 70s or 80s before. No. I mean, I, I remember the first time I went to a conference on aging and I learned that some aspects of cognition start declining at the age of 20. Right? So, <laughs> long before. But of course, you know, nobody, nobody realizes that, you know, and, uh, you know, you obviously you continue to learn at that age, you know, I mean, so you, you don't realize that. So, nobody is saying that bilingualism is magic or, you know, it's an experience that is possibly more accessible than others, right? Then, you know, learning to play an instrument, for example, things like that. So, you know, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's ubiquitous. So, um, so this is what this is what we are trying to say. Um, it's not magic, you know. It's uh, but it's uh, potentially more available, and it can be made more available. Um, but yeah, it's not the only one. Yay! May I disagree on the, on the unique and magic? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I think it is unique and magic. Because with language, apart from communicate, we can think. Yeah. And with all the other activities, all the other hobbies or music, we don't we don't need it to think. So if with language we can think and, and subconsciously we're thinking all the time. So we subconsciously we're using language all the time. And even when we're walking around, there's letters everywhere that we can read them. Right. We constantly decode and get some information out of everything. And I think that makes language really unique. Okay. And it's active all the time in everything we're doing. Even if we don't communicate, we think. Yeah. So it's much more of an intrinsic part of our lives. Yeah. You know, this is this is what you're saying. Thank yeah, you. I thank think that's why it's very Thank you, Theo. Yeah, no, I mean that's a, that's a, a, good, a good a good way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. Picking up on this point that just just been made, talking talk about language about the thinking thing. Are, are 
connections between language and feeling and emotional differences. There is a huge number of studies on bilingualism and emotions. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a colleague in London who specializes in this uh, in particular. Yeah, so um, I, uh, um, Jean-Marc De Valle, I think, you know, is the way to pronounce his name. It's a Belgian name, sorry for the mispronunciation. <laughs> But he, uh, he's, he's definitely done a lot of research on emotions and bilingualism, which, yeah, um, it's, it's very interesting. Um, so so this, this intersects with, uh, uh, I guess, uh, mental and emotional health? Well, potentially, yes, okay. potentially, yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, this is not something I work on, you know, but, but I know, you know, it exists and there's a... It's a good chunk of research on that. Yeah. If anybody is interested, interested, uh, I can put you in touch with the links. Please. Mm -hmm. Yes. Most of what you talked about tonight is about oral linguism, linguism. but it's not really talking about the written language in the act. I consider myself. Quite good at speaking the same right now. In the, my, my vocabulary is quite small not on the on, on the lingual spectrum you've got. I'm, I think I'm down near the start. I didn't I didn't get learn Latin at school, whereas everybody who I know who learned Latin has got a huge vocabulary. So what what's your question? Um, I mean um, I wasn't it's, talking about yes. Yeah. Um oral well, yeah, I mean, there are clearly, diff you know, interesting interactions, you know, between, uh, you know, the oral competence in languages and literacy, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in languages, being able to... Uh, uh, certainly to read and potentially to write. Uh, I mean, this is not, you know, relevant for early, very early bilingualism, you know, in babies and, you know, young children, because obviously that part is not available, you know, those skills are not available to babies, and yet, you know, they become bilingual just by listening, you know, and then interacting, you know, with people who speak different languages. Um, it is relevant, of course, you know, for adults, you know, older children as well, and adults who learn to who learn uh, who learn another language um, in yeah in in, uh, in different ways. I mean, quite apart from you know creating more exposure to input and more opportunities, you know, to use the language and to understand you know the nuances, you know, different different words and so on. Um, so. And I'm talking a bit when the group said, um, like, to passive, passive learning is very useful for the language learning. Uh, take an example, like, I'm Chinese, but I came under, like, Korean drama, paper, stuff like that. And I'm not trying to learn the Korean, but I can understand most of the Korean now. And, like, when I think some words or some express, what comes, uh, what comes to my mind at first is not Chinese, not English, it's Korean. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why. It's a kind of, <laughs> kind of strange. And also, uh, I'm doing a research about the Hong Kong uh, in like the language policy in Hong Kong and uh, human identity. And I found that one of the data sets, or the, like the government want to promote their Mandarin and uh, promote the Mandarin in Hong Kong while reduce the globalization in Hong Kong. And my supervisor asked me, why do you think English is represent the globalization in Hong Kong. Why not Cantonese? Why not Mandarin? Yeah, why not? Yeah. So but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Again, you know, I mean, there are, uh, no, what you were saying about Korean is interesting, you know, yes. because, uh, you know, it means that 
I mean, you know, it it's partly depends on, you know, how much a language is activated, you know, in your brain, you know. So, uh, so even if it's not your dominant language, you know, yes. if the language is activated, you know, inactive, you know, you access, you access it faster, you know, than others, you know, potentially. So, um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, the situation in Hong Kong, I mean, I, yeah, I, uh, I uh, I don't want to comment, you know, but but, but yeah, I mean, clearly uh, there are. I mean, it's a multilingual environment, right? Yes. Where, you know, um, uh, it should be uh, uh, it should be a desire of everybody to yeah. maintain multilingualism in an active way, rather than having one, you know official language that, you know, is, uh, and the situation in China, as far as I can tell, you know, it's, I mean, you have an enormous variety of, uh, of languages there, you know, one writing system, but an enormous variety of languages. And so, you know, saying that Mandarin is the language, uh, yeah, it limits, you know, this enormous variety that you're likely, likely to have. I think it, it brings to mind what you said earlier. One of the factors you mentioned is attitude. So exposure, passive exposure, yeah. depends on attitude. If it is a matter of learning or trying to learn a language from a language tape, it might be very much instrumental mm -hmm. rather than enjoying the passive exposure. Like, this Korean example. Mm -hmm. I think many Hong Kong young people are listening to Korean K-pop, uh -huh. yeah. Japanese yeah. Yeah. pop. So somehow, even, yes. if they don't, even if they don't speak it, you know, the sound and the rhythm, the dancing yes. quality is in It's motivating, yeah. 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 It's motivation. It's motivation, that's right, yeah. yeah. Um, this wasn't an issue, as far as I can tell from the, the study I mentioned, you know, California and Pennsylvania, because, you know, I mean, these people would just really heard the languages around them, you know, with no, no particular motivation, you know, or, or particular interest in, in any of these languages. They just, you know, it's a reality. They go out and, you know, they hear different languages in California much more than in Pennsylvania. So that was the difference. So... Um, Thank you very much. No, sorry. No, no, no. Uh, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I mean, very, very interesting. Yes. If you have other questions, get in touch, right? Um, you know, I have an email. You can get in touch with Values Matters. And uh, if you want to collaborate with us, you know, we welcome anybody's. Uh, Collaboration and advice. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you.